So what did we look at last class? So we looked at uh, dummies, right? I think Ankesh, you had a question about whether this dummy would be minimum length or would it be longer length or something. So why would you want to make it minimum length just to save area? Okay. So normally you want, uh, okay. So the gate, gate shadowing effect is one effect which we talked about. There are actually a couple of other effects which also go on. Okay, so typically you want that to be uh, identical to your main transistor. Okay, we'll actually look at where I'll see. I'll, I think we'll look at one of those uh, effects today, where it doesn't directly depend on the length, but it actually depends on the uh, uh, region of active around your uh, around the transistors. Okay, we'll look at one of those today. Okay. Okay, so we are looking at dummies, dummy transistors in the layout. So one of the other things last time we were looking at, let's say if you are if you're using multiple transistors, you just add multiple units, you just add one extra dummy at the end for the array. But you can also do the same thing. So let's say you just have a single transistor, but let's say you are interrogating them, single set of transistors. Okay, so what you can do is you can make uh, just the, you can add two more fingers at the end. Okay, that's all. So if you have, let's say, 20 fingers, just make it 22 and make the last two as dummies. You can just connect all the, you know, inputs and outputs to ground. So drain, source, gate, everything can be connected to ground. Okay. So you can add dummy finger. Okay. So the other thing you need to worry about is uh, something called. Okay. So these are uh, what is very common in these new processes is uh, something called shallow trench isolation or STI. You, some of you might have heard about it, right? So this is uh, typically the most common type of isolation between uh, different transistors. So, so basically if you have, let's say this is your transistor. Okay, you basically have some kind of trench on the sides. Okay, what happens is, so because of, let's say if, if, you, if your temperature changes, these trenches cause some amount of stress, okay, to your, to the tra desired transistor. Okay, and the closer they are, the more stress they exert. So what happens is, thus that stress can actually change your, uh, all kinds of parameters. It can change your BT, it can change mobility. Okay, so at the end of the day, what you're interested in is like, let's say transfer parameters like GM and so on, it will definitely change all of those. So what ends up happening is you are designing for a particular, you know, GM, but the GM will be off by, it can be as, uh, you know, in some of these deep submicron processes, it can be off by as much as like 15, 20%, okay, which is a lot, obviously. Okay, so the other thing is you can also, you know, um, if you add dummies on the sides, it helps isolate your main transistor from your trench, okay, from the effects of the trench. So obviously the, that will increase this distance, okay. So that will, that's another reason why you want to have some extra keep out region, okay. There are bunch of things like this, okay. So uh, for example, well overlap over your active, okay. So there are a bunch of things. So for example, let's say if you had a PMOS transistor and you had a well like this, you want this distance also to be larger than a certain amount. So you have requirements for that. Okay, the large, the you know, the more overlap there is, the less effect you will have. Okay, so there are, you know, you just have to know a bunch of these things. Coming back to your shallow trench isolation. So, for example, you can build a simple current mirror. Okay, and depending on this distance, okay, you can try to plot. Let's say you can try to plot your mirror ratio versus your uh, uh, separation from the you know trench the distance from the trench so it will probably look something like this okay so so if this is that distance d and this is your uh, error percentage so if the this thing is very low it it will look something like this okay so if you have very little distance 
you would actually find a lot of error okay but then after some time it actually starts to go down and obviously beyond a certain point you really don't care you know there will be other mismatch effects which come into play so you don't uh, really worry about it so there will be some optimum distance so let's say it will be a few microns uh, maybe 3 4 microns okay so that is another reason why you want to have some extra distance and add the dummies because you really don't care about the dummies so other things in the matching environment metal lines for example so we talked about having equal uh, same environment as far as the transistors are concerned so you add the dummies how about metal lines so let's say you have two transistors but let's say you are only contacting on one of them okay and you, but you still want matching okay so then you still add the metal line but no no contacts so that at least for example there will be overlap parasitic capacitance from the metal line onto this okay so you have to worry about you know matching capacitances in an rf sense or you could for example have a supply line let's say vdd running just all the way here so what you'll want to do is you'll probably want to extend it okay very small things like this can make a big difference okay so if you want to match two things try to make as many things as possible identical between those two okay uh I think the next one is oops as far as routings go try not to make 90 degree turns okay so if you if you don't do this okay if you want to do the same thing try to do something like this ah bad okay try to do something like this for all turns obviously there will be some cases where this will be you know counterproductive if the turns are very narrow in those cases you may not be able to do it okay because to do this 45 degree turn you need some you need some length so only uh, lines of a minimum length can be uh, you know can be uh, made 45 degrees but if you have that distance go ahead and do it because what happens is typically when you are looking at high frequency currents you tend to have current crowding i think we looked at this during the when we saw the inductors right you will end up having current crowdings right at the turns okay and so your density will increase there are a lot of you know effects so you'll have uh, there is something called electro migration where if your current density increases in a particular point your metal starts to erode okay so you might have uh, issues like that so 45 degree turns are much better obviously i mean what doesn't need to be said is maintain symmetry for differential routings okay so if you have two differential lines try to maintain symmetry as far as the length of the line okay the surroundings of the line so for uh, for example let's say if you have two things like this so you let's say the layout of each block is like this okay so let's say it comes out like this you probably want to do something like this so what what might happen is you can't so okay so let me so the inverters themselves may be you know quite wide whereas the routing themselves in don't be so wide so you probably have to do something like this don't bring them in for example don't bring in the line somewhere up here okay and then try to split them one like this and one like this don't do that obviously and similarly at the output okay and the other thing to remember so let's say these lines are routing out all the way so let's say you have some routing here try to replicate the routing here these are all very basic stuff okay so you're just trying to maintain the same environment that's all okay so we looked at uh, let's quickly look at for example how do you match between resistors capacitors and so on what are the what are some good practices and how do you lay out certain things okay so for example first of all i think for resistors 
we never covered what kind of uh, resistors uh, you know options you have we looked at inductors capacitors varactors and so on we never looked at resistors so let's quickly cover that before we go on to the layout of the passives okay so the different so you have uh, you know five or six different kinds of resistors you will have uh, you know many of them are uh, based on silicon itself so you have uh, n type you have p type you have different kinds there is something called uh, silicided resistor silicided is basically you have a um, um, a polysilicon piece and then you add some uh, metal de metal deposition over that to reduce the resistance okay so the metal forms a silicide compound with the silicon okay and that reduces the resistance so let's look at the different kinds so if you have if you have polysilicon resistors typically whether silicided or non silicided they'll typically have very small values obviously the lowest values will be uh, your metal routings themselves they'll give you like up to a probably a few ohms these can probably give you a few tens of ohms okay these will have relatively low cap to substrate compared to the other kinds okay not obviously compared to the metal if you make a resistor small value resistor to the topmost metal that will have the lowest cap but these will typically have lower cap to substrate and in some processes they can have smaller mismatches okay you can have them you can use your p plus and n plus silicon diffusion to create resistors so those would be low to medium resistances okay so this will be typically oh sorry typically 3 to 5 ohms per square so all of these resistors all the resistors uh, in the process will be given as uh, you'll be given the sheet resistance okay so you'll be given so many resistances per square you make it wider the resistance basically drops okay and remember for uh, for all of these resistances the wider okay at least for most of them the wider you make the resistor the better the matching would be because you know the change in the resistance for a given uh, typically it's geometric uh, variation which you are worried about okay so if you make it wider you'll get better matching okay so if you want to match two resistors make them at least maybe 1 and 1/2 to 2 microns wide okay the other thing is the diffusion resistor is going to be very sensitive to process and temperature okay because obviously you're using the diffusion so it depends on the doping levels so therefore it's going to depend on the process obviously you're depending on the semiconductor property of the material so it is going to depend on temperature okay including mobility and so on okay then you can use your nwell to create your resistor nwells are typically you know high resistivity higher than diffusion so you can make high level high value resistors okay and obviously this is also going to be process temperature sensitive and the other thing to remember about nwell resistors obviously because now they are right next to the your, your substrate they are going to have a lot of cap okay a lot of parasitic capacitance to your substrate so in other words don't use it in the signal path as much as possible okay that's what it means when you have a parasitic cap in the rf signal path for example let's say you want to make a common source amplifier with a resistive load which has maybe 1 or 2 kilo ohms you can get 1 or 2 kilo ohms with a very very thin piece and very small piece of nwell resistor but you probably don't want to do that okay you probably want to use a diffusion resistor the other thing about the nwell is the closer you go it is obviously more sensitive to picking up things from the substrate okay you definitely don't want to use those kind of things in your sensitive path <coughs> 
obviously there may be cases where you don't have a choice okay for example if you want let's say a 100 kilo ohm bias resistor you may not have a choice because if you use a diffusion it may just, it may just become too big okay so that you may end up having to use this obviously we looked at this during the vco mos resistor if you want you know really mega ohms kind of uh, you know resistance you can use this you can use a mos resistor with a very you know small uh, uh, very small w or l okay okay so and the other thing to remember is flicker noise remember that ideally your resistors are supposed to have only thermal noise okay but many of these resistors uh, well not many of them some of them could show could potentially show flicker noise okay because flicker noise is inherently happens at uh, um, interfaces between uh, you know different materials and when you rely on silicon based uh, resistors you naturally expect it won't be as high as mosfets or even bipolars but there are some special cases where you could see flicker noise okay okay how do you lay them out so let's say you want to match two two sets of resistors okay so taking a very basic case okay so the obviously the gain of this amplifier depends on r2 over r1 so you want to have so even though in the process the r r values change by quite a lot over temperature and process up to you know plus or minus 20% your ratio of the two resistors still manage to be you can get good matching between them okay so if you want let's say in r2 or r1 of let's say 4 or something like that okay so let's take the case of 1 so if you want r2 or r1 equals 1 so obviously you want to lay them out in the same orientation that is obvious okay so that is for sure now if let's say if you have uh, okay if you have let's say 1 is to 4 or something like that you might want to uh, or let's say 1 is to 8 or something like that you might want to lay them out uh, make it much smaller so let's say this is r2 and you could lay out something like this r1 right at the center okay you could do something like this so main idea is to you know try to get a regularized array you can add dummies around the other one if you want how about capacitors again same thing same orientation is a given okay but there are other things for example so so your cap has is typically proportional to the area right so it's w times l so suppose i have two options so let's say this is w this is l this is w this is l which one would you choose and why does it matter let's take the case of a you know metal oxide metal cap or a metal insulator metal cap like a passive linear cap okay does it matter which one you choose so as far as a cap goes or as far as the parasitics go it probably doesn't change too much however the que first question i would ask is where are you contacting them okay are you contacting them from this side the two caps so let's assume that's the direction so these are the two sides okay so in one case you would contact them like this in the other case ha ah, you would contact it like this which is better the second one is better obviously because you have a much wider connection so your resistance is series resistance is much lower okay so typically if you have capacitances large value capacitances where you worry about the series resistance definitely do this okay what you can do is you can kill a perfectly good design 
by doing something very bad with the capacitors. For example, you want to have, um, I assume you guys all know about this. So let us just take some inductance in the supply. Okay? And let us say your input is a clock. What is your output going to look like if you have some inductance in the supply? So first of all, this inverter is going to draw switching current. right? Every time it switches, it is going to try to draw some pulse of current. What happens? The inductor does not like changes in pulse of current. You are going to get LDI by DT drops. I assume you have seen this before in other courses. right? So what happens is, if you look at the voltage here, you are going to see uh, actually much worse than this if you just take. So you are probably going to see like this. Okay, It can go drop very low depending on the current you are drawing. Okay, It will not be VDD anymore. Like for the course, for the project, we are just assuming ideal VDDs. But in the real case, remember that from the circuit, you are you know routing a long way to the pad. You have a bond wire which goes off chip. You are going to route on the PCB and go somewhere else. Okay, So the best way to combat this is to add some cap. Okay, This is called the uh, supply decoupling cap. right? So basically the pulses of current will be drawn from the cap instead of for the from the through the inductor because the capacitor acts as a huge reservoir of charge. So anytime it tries to draw pulse of current, the capacitor supplies it. Capacitor does not allow its voltage to change suddenly. So the, it stabilizes out this voltage, so you will get something like this. And of course you will get definitely, you will get some pulses, but depending on the size of the capacitor, it will become very small. Okay. Now, you are basically relying on the fact that the capacitance is low impedance for that pulse of current. right? If you have some serious resistance with that, you can be pretty sure that you are going to kill your decoupling. Okay. And if you do something like this, a layout like this, it is a perfectly good way of killing your uh, decoupling. Okay. Similarly, you can show the same thing for your MOS cap. So let us say this is your gate. Okay. So you definitely want to make a good connection here. You definitely want this to be wide in some sense. Okay, do not make it, do not make a very, very, you can get the same amount of cap if you do something like this. Okay, but obviously this will have a very large gate resistance. Okay, you probably do not want to do that. And again, for all of these caps, try to, you know, because you are trying to get a lot of cap, let us say if you take a decoupling cap, you are trying more cap is usually always better. So you do not care about parasitic cap. So do not mind, you know, stacking up different metal layers on top of this. Okay, So do not worry about stacking metal layers on top of decoupling cap. Extra cap only helps you. right? You want to minimize the resistance, so try to stack as many metal layers as possible. Okay. What else? Um, the other things I think sp ah. transistors. We already looked at the splitting transistors into fingers and so on. But the one thing to remember is splitting into fingers can also be useful. Let us say even the capacitor, right? Instead of uh, having one large capacitor or one large transistor, splitting into more devices can help in other ways. So one thing is if you have the signal transistor. But let us take the case of the bias. Bias transistors are typically much larger than the signal transistor. It helps you to actually um, do your floor planning. For example, this, this may be your signal, okay? but the extra space you have may only be here. Why? Maybe your signal input is coming here, output is going here. Okay? You could perfectly well have a case like this. So if you have something like this, why would you place the bias? So you can, you can split the bias transistors. Okay, very nicely. Bias transistors, as long as they are you know laid out in an array here internally, you can have some decent matching. Okay, you don't want to spread it out too far, but you can try to change it, you know, work around it. Or or for example, you may not your bias you may split like this, this may be cap. Cap, you know, you can spread it around. And that's usually perfectly fine. 
okay you have something called antenna effects basic idea is so let's say you have a very large sheet of metal connected to the gate of a transistor okay so typically what can happen is during your etching you know and your processing uh, procedure this thing can build up charge because remember you are laying out layer one by one so this typically after this metal layer is done it is a standalone metal layer it is not connected to anything okay so this can pick up a lot of charge and then break down your gate okay discharge through the gate and break it okay break break it down so if you want to typically if you want to prevent this one common way is to add a reverse bias diode a very small so you have rules for that so you know for a given amount of area you need to have a certain amount of diode reverse bias diode connected to your long lines or what you could do is you could split this up such that it goes up goes up goes come comes you know goes up to one metal layer and then comes back down you can add vias to break the connections to your gate you can do techniques like that density okay how about uh, so one of the requirements from the process is if you have so for the okay for the integrity of the process the device engineers require you to have a minimum density or minimum percentage of area covered with certain layers and typically most layers will have that okay and for some layers it will be small other layers this density will be large typically for metal you need to have 80% of your device of your chip area covered with metal on each metal layer this is very typical okay rather uh, actually yes that's right so it it could be 80% let's say let's say 80% okay so you could have requirements like this so what you have to do is obviously your circuit routings and everything are going to contribute maybe 10% or 15% probably not much more so if you want to make this up you will typically have to do what is called fill for your transistors so you will have to put in what is called dummy metal there will be just be floating pieces of metal so your block may be here and on top of that so they will put in dummy pieces of metal on all metal layers ok it will just be an array and typically you want to even be able to see your circuit once it is filled ok and now you obviously for sensitive circuits you want to prevent this so you will have to make sure so typically for rf circuits for the signal portion of the circuits you definitely want to do what is called custom fill so there are auto programs obviously it will find out what metal layer is available already there and it won't fill on that metal layer but it fill on other metal layers okay but you don't want to do that okay so normally what you would do is so you'd have a signal portion and you'd have a bias portion let's say and you can fill here okay okay and you normally want to do what is called custom fill which is which is filling by hand so you go in and keep putting you know little by little filling them in that's you know you definitely have to do that and again so let's say so you have differential lines again you have to be very careful about the fill okay make sure your fill is symmetric something like this make sure it's symmetric okay don't for example don't fill on one side not fill on the other side don't fill one side farther away than the other side so those are all things you have to take care of okay and typically what you'll have to do is um, around inductors you can leave out fill okay normally around the inductors the foundry will give you some waiver because obviously the inductor is going to be huge it may be 200 microns by 200 microns and that means that your uh, that area is definitely going to have low density for lower metals okay and you can't do anything about that okay and you know usually the foundry will tell you okay they'll give you something called a waiver they'll review the layout and they'll give you a waiver okay what else uh, you can fill obviously we looked at filling on the bias circuits the other thing to know for transistors don't stack up too many too many metal lines here 
on the drain source okay because you'll have extra capacitance to the gates okay fill up just enough so that you meet current density requirements so let's say you have to route a long way so let's say from um from your vco to your mixer or from your vco to divider to your mixer okay so it, you can have very long lines so first of all so let's say it's like this and let's say this is your divider let's say this is 1 mm something like 1 mm okay first of all how will you design these lines would you make them wide would you make them thin what metal layer would you use for them you would make them very wide why sorry oh the resistance of the lines okay so you want to make them wide because of the resistance okay but what happens if you make it wide obviously you'll have some extra capacitance and you have to be careful because if you have too much capacitance then you'll be burning a lot of power trying to drive it okay so at the end of the day there will be what you will see is if you look around at these rc values there will be a certain optimum resistance and capacitance okay and an optimum power which you can so you you'll make them oh obviously l of is not that okay so obviously there will be an optimum width okay now the next question is if they're going from the vco to the divider they're going to be very sensitive lines do you want to add a shield for them uh, so let us say you add a shield on both sides okay what happens so now you have some extra capacitance to the shield apart from the substrate so you have the capacitance of the substrate already you are basically adding extra capacitance okay so now you need to space them out wider okay now again if you space them out wider then you are you are using up more area first of all the second thing is if you know if there is something coming in from the substrate okay it, this thing might pick it up okay but yeah so you can't do uh, you can only do so much area okay okay there will be metal lines okay so let's say this is on uh, m3 so these will also be on m3 okay you can actually make a you know multi layer shield also for example if this is on m3 you can add shield on top on m2 uh, on m4 and shield on bottom on m2 also so you can basically make it a square thing but remember the this distance you can actually control the vertical distance between the metals you cannot control so typically you don't prefer to add a, a shield on the bottom okay you would if you are going to add you typically add it on the sides okay yes so which is why you're not going to add on top of it you're going to add to the side on m4 or m5 on top of this you would know you typically don't want to cross you don't want to cross these two lines sensitive lines at all now there may be cases where you are forced to cross in which case you make those cross lines extremely small so that extremely thin okay and short obviously you don't run lengthwise you run perpendicular that is one thing you can do second thing you can for example use it on as far away a metal layer as possible okay so if this is on m3 you either want to do it on m6 or on m1 okay depending on the signal so you may not be able to do it on uh, immediately adjacent metal layer we'll add extra cap next we'll look at substrate contacts so let's just take the case of a transistor so normally okay so let's take the case of an inverter okay so that maybe that's the easiest let's take a inverter with two fingers so normally you know your substrate and ground would let's say this is your vdd and ground and you would put your substrate contacts right below your vdd and ground lines okay look like this but if your circuit is sensitive you may also want to put in contacts here on the sides 
okay because you want to give a really good substrate remember that a lot of transistor parameters depends on the substrate okay things like threshold voltage and those things if 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 there is any substrate current right and there will always be some rf current being sent into the substrate okay what you will see is if the substrate has some let's say some series resistance that will build up a voltage okay and if your if your substrate voltage is wiggling then what happens is your transistor threshold voltage is changing over time for example okay so you want to prevent that so you want to give a very very good substrate contact and typically so there will be specialized rf transistors which are very well modeled okay so these if you look at the basic transistor model they basically just model all the way up to m1 probably just enough to give contacts and connect it out okay any metal lines added up are not uh, uh, modeled if you add substrate contacts they are not modeled however every process especially an analog or rf process will have an rf transistor which would typically have you'd have the transistor and the the you would have actually a substrate ring around it okay and this transistor as a unit will be modeled okay including the impedances the resistances of substrate and so on everything will be modeled so uh, typically if you use an rf transistor what you see is what you get as in if you design for a particular thing uh, it will be modeled based on your what your lay because your layout is perfectly fixed usually you will measure what you wanted to measure okay from the transistor itself okay so that's as far as your sub contacts go so what does the substrate contact do so if you have let's say a switching transistor so let's say you give a trans, um, an inverter and then you give it a clock signal the substrate will always have some impedance some inductance or whatever right some impedance so definitely your substrate will be wiggling so what effectively is happening is your tra your transistor your noisy transistor is injecting something into the substrate okay if other transistors share the same substrate they can actually get um, um, you know that it, through that substrate they'll pick up this noise okay and that's one of the reasons why you're trying to give this substrate contact because your so your substrate at the end is going to be connected to a, a central ground somewhere else far far away okay so you want to give it a very very short local ground because what will happen is you you this will be running on metal okay so this will be the substrate contacts will be routed on metal and then they'll be connected to ground on metal so you'll be giving a very good contact that's the idea okay now so let's say you are you have built your circuit as a block okay around your overall circuit it's actually not uncommon to put what is called a guard ring okay so the main idea is so let us say there is a noisy block right next to this block okay and which is injecting something into the substrate so you want to pick it up before it reaches your sensitive circuit so in that case you would put something like a guard ring okay so if you have a noisy thing which is this thing so it will get pulled up through the metal and go straight to ground which is through the low impedance path okay so typically a substrate contact substrate ring will prevent your circuit from injecting noise into the substrate a guard ring would protect your overall block from picking up things okay and now obviously okay so let's say now you have a guard ring and you have a substrate ring inside okay so remember because these two have totally different functions do not connect them to in, at the end to the same ground okay so don't you know let's say this is your ground pad use a separate ground pad for the uh, substrate ring if you end up connecting these two there's it's the same thing as not having the almost the same thing as not having the guard ring okay because at the end of the day it is going to go out like this through the low impedance path and come back through to the substrate directly you understand what i'm saying right then, so, where will the connect sorry where will okay so these two will be pads so you'll have a bond ring so the idea is to increase the impedance between those two paths so that at any time the you know the noise current has a choice between which paths to flow it will flow through the low impedance path so obviously at some point of time it's going to be connected up but you keep increasing the impedances along this path until when the noise wants to split right so let us say it's coming here at this point the noise wants to split you are going to have a very good connection to ground on the pcb let's say so it is going to prefer to go there instead of coming back through this that is the idea try to increase the impedances on the two paths
apart from what okay apart from that will be your best choice okay that will be your best choice there are obviously cases where you may not have so many pads in which case you would have to decide so depending on whether the circuit is noisy or whether it's you know you're interested in protecting it you'll have to decide to group the grounds together that is a totally different topic by itself uh, that is something you definitely uh, will have to make a choice there um, if it is a very sensitive circuit most people would prefer to connect its own substrate to its own ground okay rather than connect it to the guard ring especially if there's a noisy circuit so it depends on a number of things it depends on the surrounding environment it depends on this circuit itself so i'll give you an example so if you just take a switching inverter right it is going to be pumping something into the substrate if you connect it to its own ground you want to keep its ground clean okay for the inverter to switch well if you connect it to its own ground you may end up spoiling you know your own in, uh, inverter switching characteristic so there you may have to be careful okay you may you may choose to do the substrate ground and guard ring connection differently from let's say if you had a vco or if you had an lna if you had an lna probably since it's a small signal circuit your substrate is not going to be wiggling around too much okay so in which case you can connect it to its own uh, uh, ground and then just have two connections maybe ground and substrate connection guard ring connection okay other general layout practices so do a general floor plan first okay so that much is uh, that is very important so the minute you finish designing your circuit if you any before you start your detailed layout do a floor plan already have in your mind where you want to place certain things especially the large start off with the largest things let's say if you have an inductor place it in a certain way let's say next thing is how where would you place your transistors where would you place your resistors capacitors and so on so you start off by placing them before you start doing the detailed routing okay then plan when you do the floor plan you have to plan for a say a certain signal flow so let's say if you have an op amp so you you need to find out in the overall layout where your signal is coming in and where your signal is going out so you need to maintain that signal flow you can't lay out lay out your op amp such that if your input is coming in from the left and output is going to the right okay you can't lay out your op amp the other way around obviously then you'll be routing out like this and then routing out like that you don't want to do that okay so you want to maintain that signal flow similarly inside the op amp okay so uh, let's say it's a folded cas code right you have the input pair you have the cas code you have so you probably want to maintain the input pair somewhere close to the left it doesn't have to be all the way to the left but you you don't want to place it all the way to the right because then you'll have input output crossovers and that's usually very bad okay so you probably want to maintain it some, somewhere to the close and let's say the output cas code transistors you want them to be as far to the right as possible next thing you might want to do is plan your metal weights for your current density and your rc parasitics for example you take your vdd lines you don't care about capacitance you want to make them as wide as possible find out how much total current your uh, um, circuit is taking peak current okay so plan and give some margin and then you put it in there okay and you probably want to stack up multiple metals if you are connecting let's say one inverter to the other you may just decide to do a, a smaller thinner piece of metal okay so those are all things you can you can plan for <coughs> obviously vdd ground directions okay where is it going is it going to come from the top or the bottom sometimes you can flip it okay normal convention is vdd at the top ground at the bottom but in the layout it really doesn't matter okay so let's say you have two circuits and you are they share the same vdd and ground so let's say you have vdd you have ground okay so you can do something like this so you can just flip over so let's say you have a differential circuit okay you can flip over and share the same ground okay and put the two vdds on either side okay that's that's something very simple you can do 
if you have let's say differential circuits or symmetric circuits the the from a top top view or symmetry point of view the best thing you can do is lay out one half and mirror it over okay that will give you absolute symmetry as far as layout is concerned okay you don't have to rely on anything else however this may not always be possible okay and it may not always be optimum for for a given process so what happens is you can think about symmetry at the top level and symmetry at the trans or matching at the trans lower level okay there may be cases let's say if you take a folded cascode again you might have a case where you want to let's say if you take all the p mirrors right you want to place them all close to each other and you want to interdigitate and so on that basically completely kills your top level uh, symmetry okay or you can just choose to forget about symmetry for the time being just lay out one half and just flip it over okay normally what happens is for longer length process like 1 micron 0.75 micron and so on it made sense to interdigitate it made sense to do you know lay out transistors as a unit at the lower level however as we go into sub micron processes it's becoming more common to actually lay out one half and mirror it over that is look for top level symmetry okay main one of the main reasons is obviously dimensions are shrinking dimensions are shrinking to some extent and you have mismatches at you know at the bottom level and you have mismatches at the top level okay it so turns out you are more worried about mismatches at the higher level okay okay so one last thing i think i skipped it yes metal routings okay so you have a choice on which metal you want to choose okay so you have let's say if you take any typical process nowadays they have five or six metal layers okay so you always have a choice and normally the way you would choose is so let's take the lowest metal layers okay because they have a lot of parasitic capacitance to to ground you don't want to route signal lines on m1 or m2 okay you probably want to do for example substrate contacts they all contact you have to use m1 so at the lower level as long as you don't have to route a long way you can use them for vdd and ground but definitely if you have control lines power on power off or like uh, uh, you know gain control you know those kind of things you can choose to do m1 m2 and m1 to and m2 also to some extent okay m3 m4 they are sufficiently you know high above the substrate that you can use them for signal routing and typically let's say if you have five or six metal layers you would want to restrict yourself to m4 that will give you the most optimum performance and if you have to cross over some other m4 if you have clashes then you go down to m3 and then come back up again okay so that is what you would use and primarily m4 and normally m1 to m4 will be thin metals m5 m6 and higher metals should usually be thicker metals now you may think that let's say if you take let's say m5 and m6 are thick metals right you may think you may you may wonder why you don't route the signal on m5 itself okay because it's definitely higher up from the substrate so it should be lower capacitance but it so happens so first of all because they are thicker your minimum width is no longer the same so let's say if this minimum width was let's say 0.2 microns this minimum width may be 1 micron something like that okay so if you really want to route short distances this doesn't make sense to go to a wider metal even though it's higher because it's wider you'll have more parasitic cap okay the second thing is nowadays these metals especially if you go to an rf process they are so thick that you actually have a lot of fringing cap okay so that is that becomes more significant than your substrate cap okay so normally you would you would just go ahead and prefer to do it on m4 instead of going to m5 at all and that turns out to be the most optimum even if you are routing long distances okay <coughs>
okay then you may choose to use the thick metals to route vdds and grounds at the top level for example once you start combining multiple circuits your vdd and ground lines start carrying a lot of current and definitely thicker lines m5 m6 are going to have lower resistance and larger current densities they can handle larger current densities so you probably want to go like this okay and obviously this includes a lot of things for example it's not just vdd and ground all all high current okay okay so i think uh, we are done um, i don't think we have anything else to cover i think uh, we have covered uh, most of the things which i wanted to cover i think as far as the layout is concerned we didn't get to do a sample layout but i think that's okay okay we have talked about all the basic practices if you really want to do a sample layout you can you know pick up from where we have left off i think that's okay okay so um, yeah i think we'll stop here and then i think we are meeting next on sunday okay so make sure everybody try to attend the two weekend classes don't bunk it just because uh, it's on the weekend okay the main reason is we are trying to 